I just want to thank Frank, Rafif, and Brenna for um, getting us together here and for the amazing work that you've been doing. Um, I also want to thank the Russell Tribunal because um, I think it's really been bringing persist per persistent attention to the issue of Palestine and also helping to bridge the gap between legal and political expertise and other forms of knowledge, critique, and protest. Um, as many of you um, may have felt, speaking out about Palestine and Israel is very difficult often because of the um, environment of intimidation, charges of anti-Semitism, and often we don't feel that we know enough if we're not Palestinian or if we have, don't have research experience to really talk um, in substantial ways about the issues. And so some people um, are bowed in the face of accusations of one kind of um, violence, which uh, has the public reputation of violence um, and are um, forced into positions that are ostensibly nonviolent, which um, I will be talking about in a moment, um, as obviously um, a form of violence. But I, I want us to be thinking also about ways that we can participate in this conversation, whether we're activists, scholars, both. Um, students and others who um, need to be part of this movement, should be a part of this movement, and we need to support each other in our learning about this movement. So as you can already tell, I'm taking the tone down a little bit um, because I do find that since I've been working on the issue of Palestine, which I should mention I first started thinking about from my own um, family history, um, I'm, my parents are not Palestinian, but my mother's partner of 20 years is. and. Um, it was um, through him that I first began to think about Palestine uh, um, in specific ways, and I was also fortunate enough to be the um, student of Edward Said. So I, I learned uh, about Palestine. <laughs> um, I didn't know that would have that reaction, but. Um, Yes, I, I, was, I was deeply <laughs> deeply fortunate. And, and I should say, though, on that note, since you all evidently know who Edward Said was, um, that um, I was in a literature PhD program. I went to that program, which at the time did not have such a good reputation, because I knew Said was there. Um, but I, the, in the classroom, the content of our courses was not, was not necessarily, and I think strategically, not focused on Palestine. Um, it was really along the edges of our life in the academy and really in interactions that Saeed made possible. Um, and he told me to call him Edward, but I've really, I never could do that, except in, except in the emails where, which I, where I dutifully wrote, Dear Edward. But anyway, he will always be Saeed to me. Um, Professor Saeed would, would speak to us um, about uh, various kinds of things and also sometimes translate materials from Arabic where, where a lot of the materials were available and were not yet um, available in English some 20 years ago um, when I was beginning to read these materials. So it, those were things were obviously very influential. But for so many years after that, I, I never spoke publicly about Palestine, nor did I try to give a talk about Palestine. And to this day, these are the most nerve wracking talks that I give. Um, because I know that the nature of the conversation afterwards will sometimes be accusatory and certainly will often ask me to speak from a certain kind of expertise. So I'm, my, the rest of my talk is really to think about that question of expertise and what feminists have had to say about that and to think also about how we might all be engaged. So I want to tell you a little bit about the context of my own involvement. Um, as some of you may know in this room, um, feminists have been critical of the category of expertise for quite some time. And in fact, increasingly, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but in the United States, we can't hear anything really on the, on the mainstream news about Palestine. Um, we sometimes see a little bit of news about Israel, um, which seems to um, ostensibly have not much to do with Palestine. And um, so it's very difficult to have an informed conversation. It is also true that especially since 9-11, um, women are hardly ever called upon to be experts on things. And certainly feminists are rarely called upon to, to be experts on anything that seems to have to do with war, conflict, or other categories that they, the media choose. So it's been really important for us to be critical of this production of a different kind of expertise and uh, the delimitation of expertise. And I'm sorry, but I did the very bad thing of not turning on my timer. So can you tell me how? 
how long I've been going so far? I think about five minutes. Okay, okay. all right, perfect. Um, <laughs> it was the Saeed thing that threw me off. Um, <laughs> So um, in order to think about what kind of expertise that I felt that I could bring to bear on the question of Palestine, I, I, I had long wanted to make a visit. And there's been a lot of criticism of solidarity tourism. You know, the idea that you go someplace and just because you witness for five days, you suddenly come back and see yourself as an expert. So I'm not encouraging that kind of tourism. Rather, I went on a delegation, which I will explain to you in just a moment, because we wanted to be in collaboration with people in Palestine working on the issues for Palestinians, but also thinking about the broader feminist and abolitionist prison movement. And so it was a journey which was to connect us to people that we had sometimes read, but um, to connect us also to those that we could not read or could not meet because of their inability to travel, because of the inability for them to finish their educations or to um, have their publications um, available for us. So I became a member of the, um, an indigenous and women of color delegation to Palestine in June 2011. Our, our itinerary was a, a, a very com compressed one, um, but um, importantly, because we were responding already to the calls for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, we didn't enter through Tel Aviv, we entered through Jordan and the Alamy Bridge. And of course, if any of you, I should maybe ask, how many of you have been to uh, the occupied territories? Oh, quite a number of you. Um, we can talk about that, but if you've ever been through any of these checkpoints, um, you know how, how um, harrowing it is. Not necessarily for those of us who have passport privilege, but because you are certainly, from the very moment you enter, witness to a ho whole variety of um, horrors and violations. Now, what I found most surprising um, on my visit was, is what's remarked upon by many people who visit Palestine for the first time. I sort of thought that the problem, the political problem of Palestine from the vantage point of the US was that um, the, the repression was very subtle and that you would have to be someone who's experienced it, who's been detained, who in some way um, has um, you know, seen things um, through a, a special lens to actually observe it. What's shocking to those of us who've been is how present it is in every single space of life. There's really no way to avoid this um, uh, oppression and the occupation. However, I also knew that I had um, been meeting people um, because of the fact that the Israeli government has been encouraging especially African Americans and many faculty to come and visit. And I had encountered people who said, oh yes, I went to Israel and I, when I would follow with, so what did you think about the occupation, would tell me, oh, we didn't go to the occupied territories, we didn't see anything. It really strikes me that it's possible to bring people on a tour of Israel, but it's also possible for people to not mobilize their own um, otherwise sophisticated analysis of a system that should be, for those of us who are African Americans from the United States, um, very familiar in many ways. So those of us who went on this trip wrote a statement following our, our journey, and I'll just read to you from um, a couple of passages from that statement. And our statement ended calling, of course, for um, support of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. I quote, an extensive prison system bolsters the occupation and suppresses resistance. Everywhere we went, we met people who had either been in prison themselves or had relatives who had been incarcerated. 20,000 Palestinians are locked inside Israeli prisons. At least 8,000 of them are political prisoners and more than 300 are children. In Jerusalem, we met with members of the Palestinian Legislative Council who are being protected from arrest by the International Committee of the Red Cross and Amal Fam. We met with an Islamist leader just after his release from prison and heard a riveting account of his experience on the Mar 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 oh, sorry, Mar Mar and the 2010 Gaza flotilla. The criminalization of their political activity and that of the many Palestinians we met was a constant and harrowing theme. We also came to understand how overt repression is buttressed by deceptive rep representations of the state of Israel as the most developed social democracy in the region. 
As feminists, we deplore the Israeli practice of, quote, pinkwashing. Everyone in here know what that is? Who doesn't know what that means? Okay, I'll spend some time explaining it. Um, the state's use of ostensible support for gender and sexual equality to dress up its occupation. I'll talk about that in a moment again. In Palestine, we consistently found evidence and analyses of a more substantive approach to an indivisible justice. We met the president and the leadership of the Arab Feminist Union and several other women's groups in Nablus who spoke about the role and struggles of Palestinian women on several fronts. We visited one of the oldest women's empowerment centers in Palestine, in Nasha al-Usra, and learned about various income-generating cultural projects. We also spoke with Palestinian queers for BDS, young organizers who frame the struggle for gender and sexual justice as part and parcel of a comprehensive framework for self-determination and liberation. Feminist colleagues at Birzet University, Anaja University, and Mara al Carmel spoke to us about the organic linkage of anti colonial resistance with gender and sexual equality, as well as about the transformation, sorry, transformative role Palestinian institutions of higher education play in these struggles. And, and our statement goes on. But I really want to pick up on um, the question of feminism and the question of pinkwashing. And since some of you don't know what that means, I want to quote from. Um, Hanin Mak um, Maki and um, Haika Shulton's piece, which was um, published in Jadalia some time ago. Um, they write, Zionism must be understood as a historically specific racialized process through which different discourses of sexuality emerge that bolster rather than undermine Zionist ideology. In this context, pinkwashing is a tactic of Zionism and an influential discourse of sexuality that has emerged within it. And what she's referring to is the habit um, of the Israeli state representing itself as the only democracy in the Middle East, a place where queers can come and be taken in. And they also, as Hanin um, mentioned at our panel at the World Social Forum, uh, Free Palestine, uh, a year or so ago, that problem that um, representing queers in Palestine as of and not just in Palestine is an ongoing challenge. In other words, Palestinian queers are treated by definition by Israel as if they must want to be a part of Israel. And so the problem of fighting uh, pinkwashing is a problem of revealing the practices of the Israeli state. But our delegation sought to think feminism also through other questions. We went with the intention of building solidarity with two communities at least, prison abolitionists um, and those especially African Americans who were involved in the anti-apartheid movement, as well as the feminist and queer movements often struggling with the pinkwashed image of Israel as the democratic emblem of the Middle East. Um, and that meant working to understand um, two analogies to Palestine and the Palestinian situation. And I just want to say that um, in much of the debate about what's happening with the politics around speaking out about Palestine, there's a real question about the use of analogies. What does it mean to say, for example, that this is a prison? What does it mean to say that occupied territory is a prison? And many people say, well, it's not exactly a prison in this way. And so much of what we wanted to talk about and think about carefully was what we could say about this analogy. How precise an analogy is it? Is it only an analogy? Or are we actually claiming something um, important about Palestine? We also wanted to talk about the analogy to apartheid because this too has been challenged, as if either the specificity of South Africa is so strong or that there is something um, importantly different and distinct about the Palestinian situation. And so I just wanna say that of course there is something distinct about the Palestinian situation, but I nonetheless think it's important for us to make use of those other domains we come to understand in political terms to have a conversation that opens with to the question of Palestine. And one of my top, one of our connections in uh, Palestine seems closer to our agenda today since we're talking about G4S, but I wanna begin with the um, controversy, of, I'm sorry, with the post-apartheid com uh, 
context because, uh, of course, many of us have been following um, South Africa, especially this past week or so since the death of Nelson Mandela, and also because um, of some conversations that Angela and I and some others have had over the years with people in South Africa. Some 10 years ago, when um, we made a visit there, um, maybe more than 10 years ago, um, we visited a couple of prisons. And one of the things that we got into an argument with several of our um, South African friends about, people who were otherwise very progressive on many issues, was about what they were doing in terms of the prisons. What they were doing at the time was both building more prisons and also accepting the presence of private prisons. And we should be thinking even more critically about this, given that our topic today is G4S, because of the presence of G4S also in South Africa. And I know we'll have some questions and, and discussion of that later. Um, what we found it was difficult to explain to our friends is what the building of these prisons would do to South Africa. Because they would say to us, oh, don't worry, we know that incarceration is a result of politics. We know it's also a result of poverty. Once we eliminate poverty and we change the politics, we will get rid of the prisons. But as any prison activist knows, anyone who's been working on abolition knows, when you build more prisons, you fill more prisons. And so we wanted to talk, have that discussion with them, even in these early, earlier years, because we felt that our cautions could help them frame the new state they were building. And this was a part of the conversation that we also had while in Palestine. In Palestine, the prison issue today is not an issue that makes people ashamed. Everywhere we went, people were telling us about their incarcerations. There were special uh, fellowships and scholarships set aside in the universities for those who had been incarcerated or whose families had, been, had, had incarcerations. When we asked people to stand in rooms and say if they themselves had been incarcerated or if someone in their families had been affected, people proudly stood because everyone understood in the Palestinian context that imprisonment was political. But the following question, the question we had after this discussion began was, what do you think that means about the shape of a future state? What kind of conversation can we have together about prison abolition and about the development of freedom inside Palestine? And so for the duration of our trip, we remained engaged in those kinds of conversations and questions. Uh, it was incredibly important from the time we were in Sheikh Jarrah when we met an 11-year-old who had already been in prison three times within the last year. He had been detained, and of course, many of you may know that one of the main problems for Palestinians in terms of their incarcerations and detention is that there are several overlapping legal systems present inside um, that affect Palestinians. Israelis are subject to Israeli civil law, but Palestinians are subject to several overlapping legal regimes from every episode of ancient and colonial history, including customary law, Ottoman law, Egyptian law in Gaza, Jordanian law in the West Bank, as well as the new legal context of the state in formation, which is based on both Islamic law or Sharia and other practice. And Palestinians often do not know what, which of the laws they're going to be accused under, and therefore what system they will be fighting. <laughs> it is very dif difficult to think about this, the effect that this accretion of laws has, the jurisdictional challenges, and the various other kinds of legal challenges that there are in the Palestinian context. And so in thinking about um, the positive project of prison abolition, which we came there to speak about, meaning that we often think about prison abolition in terms of what we need to remove, right? We wanna get rid of the prison. But the question is, what is the positive project of abolition? What is it we're trying to build? And so our conversations in Palestine were obviously focused on the incredibly egregious 
um, violations that we observed, and I could spend a lot more time de detailing them, but I'm going to skip it because I know you're waiting for a certain speaker. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I certainly could, could detail many of uh, those things that we observed here. But I think it's more important for me to um, begin to close by saying that um, with all of these violations, focusing on a feminist definition of security, which is not G4S's definition of security, which is very much about securing access to water, which was incredibly complicated inside the occupied territories. Where you saw green trees, you knew settlers lived. Getting access to food, getting access to education, because children in Palestine were often lining up at checkpoints for more than two hours to get to school on the other side. And if they were late, or if, their children, if the children failed to arrive at school, the parents would pay the price in terms of their inability to travel or have access. There were, the security also needs to be defined in terms of our ability to access our rights of citizenship, obviously, but it also needs to be de um, determined in terms of our access to expressing ourselves in terms of gender and sexuality, and it also needs to be defined in terms of other aspects that are often hidden when we're talking about the problem of security. And so for us tonight, to think critically about the security discourse, about G4S, to think about how the limitations, as uh, um, we were hearing about earlier, of the approach to always invoking international law might be a way for us to begin to have a new dialogue that would, in fact, join us as feminists, as prison abolitionists, and as those who believe in a free Palestine in a new kind of conversation. Thank you.